There's really not that many reasons why you would want to make a visual novel in Unreal 4, but obviously if you're watching this then you want to. There's a lot of cons, the main one being that you have to actually program the logic yourself, and it would be easier obviously to just do something in RenP. But the pros are that if you want to actually make like mini games, it you know helps to have an actual game engine compared to having to use um, Python or whatever in RenP to sort of set that up. And the other pro is that you can use 3D backgrounds, obviously, instead of just 2D uh, backgrounds. And we'll get to that later, but in this video, we are going to be making the minigame. And I decided to just make that minigame Othello, mainly because I already know that it works. And I already have the assets I need for it, which, you know, aren't very complicated, but I still don't want to model chess pieces. Now, in case you're watching this and you're wondering if you have to watch the rest of the visual novel series to uh, understand anything in this tutorial. That's not the case, the Othello is sort of just completely independent of the visual novel tutorial and it'll just only come up at the very end. Now in case you don't know the rules of Othello, I'm just gonna explain it really quick. You start off with four pieces in the middle of an 8x8 board. Uh, two black pieces and two white pieces. And in the original version of Othello, you could place them wherever you wanted in the center. So it could be black, black, white, white for example, but uh, recent versions of Othello, you just have black, white, white, black. It They sort of Go in this pattern. In order to place a piece on a board, you have to sandwich a array of the other colored pieces in between your piece. For example, black can go here, 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 or here, but they can't go here because there is no white piece in between this black piece and this black piece. Edges do not count towards being your own piece. For example, if this was go, the edge would sort of count as your piece whenever you're trying to capture a piece. Uh, that's not the case with Othello. So when you place a piece, let's say we place it over here, you'll notice that white gets flipped over. That's because everything in between your pieces gets flipped over to become uh, your piece, for example. And then it becomes white's turn if white has a move available. If white does not have a move available, then it's still your turn. And if you do have a move available, you have to keep playing, even if that move is not great for you. So now that it's white's turn, because white does have a move available, it can go here, here, or here. So let's say white goes here, that black, uh, that black piece gets flipped over. Flipped over. If black goes here, this white piece gets flipped over, and so on. And the game keeps going until um, either nobody has any moves available or all the pieces are filled up. So if white were to go here, these two black pieces will get flipped over because they're both in between the white pieces, like that. And if black were to go here, these three white pieces will get flipped over because there is a black um, sandwiching them. So we're back in a visual novel project. I'm just going to make a new folder for our actual Azello stuff because there's really not that much stuff and uh, they might as well just go all in the same folder. We're going to make a new blueprint class for our game mode. Uh, this is going to be our Othello GM. We need another blueprint class for our um, Othello, let's just call this BP. This is going to handle all the uh, logic for our Othello game. And then we're going to need another actor. This is going to be our, let's say, Othello board uh, piece. We also need the static meshes to represent our board and our pieces, and I have them already made. So you see over here I have something called Azello.fbx. If I just drag this into Unreal, you'll see that we have our import options. We could say it's a skeletal mesh, but it isn't because, well, it's not rigged or has any animations or anything like that. We'll just take care of that in Unreal. Auto-generate collisions, it doesn't really matter because we're not going to be using collisions, so I'm just going to make this false. Uh, we're not going to import the materials or textures because I don't have any materials or textures. So if we just import all, you'll see that we now have our piece and we have our container. Our container is just a 100 by 100 uh, box with a slightly raged edge, and our piece is just a cylinder with a... well, the UVs are split so that the top side is one material and the bottom side is another material. So let's take care of those materials really quick. If we right click, we can go to a new material, and this is going to be our... Uh, let's go with board mat. And for the board, I'm just going to make it a brown color. So if I hold on to 3 and click, you'll see that we now have a vector 3 and I can just pass this into our base color and then if I double click this I can give it a color so let's bring this somewhere like there so if we hit OK and we wait for this to compile you'll see that we have a brown color we can just go back to our container and choose our board mat and it is now brown I'm going to do the same thing for our little piece we need a new material this is going to be our white mat 
and once again we just hold down 3, click base color and this is gonna be white. Uh, technically when you're doing stuff with PBR you don't want the actual albedo or the base color to be pure white or pure black. You want it to be slightly less than that because that's how real world values work. But um, it doesn't really matter for this case, it's just an example. And if you wanted it to look good, you would probably, well, take the time to make it look good. So we're going to right click, do another material, we'll call this black matte. One more time, hold on to 3, click base color and we'll just leave it as black. Back in our Zello piece. We're just going to go to our materials. For the first one, I'm going to make it the white, and for the second one, I'm going to make it black. So if you look at it now, you'll see that it's split in half with the white on top and the black on the bottom. Back in our Azello board piece, I'm going to open the full blueprint editor for one, and in the viewport up here, uh, this is not something that we really had in our visual novel tutorial so far because we never really had anything with actors. But when you have a actor, you have a viewport tab over here where you can sort of change how your actor looks. So over here on the top left, you can click Add Component. And what we're going to add is a uh, mesh, static mesh. There it is. And its first static mesh is just going to be our board. And then down on the bottom or on your right, if you have your uh, setup as a default Unreal uh, setup, you can see we have an option for our static mesh and we can just go and choose our Othello or Othello container. And now we have our container in here. We're also going to add our piece in here because every container can only ever have one piece. So we might as well just add the pieces here instead of spawning them at runtime. Plus it makes it easier to do animations with it in um, Unreal. Well, they're not really animations, but it's close enough. So we're going to add another static mesh. And this one is going to be our piece. And in the static mesh, we're just going to choose our as a low piece. And now you see we have our piece in here. By default, I don't want this to be visible because most of the pieces on the board are going to be invisible um, when you start the game. So over here down in rendering, I'm just set visible to false. So now it is no longer visible. Back in our event graph, we can get rid of all of these. And to do the actual animation for our piece, what we're going to do is do some timelines. So if we right click and say timeline, we can do add timeline, which is something uh, you can not do with widgets. We can add a timeline here. This is going to be our uh, piece, let's say falling timeline. And if we double click this, you'll see that we now have um, a separate window. And this is where we can add a bunch of curves to our timeline. So if we hit this uh, F plus button over here, we can add a new float track. And I'm going to name this track. Let's go with height. And this is going to be how high our piece is as it's falling. So we can right click, add a new key to this. And at time 0, I'm going to make the height something like, I don't know, 200. And we can change the length of this animation to be, or this timeline to be, um, let's go with 1. And then we can right click again, add a key. And at time 1, we can add a value of 0. So if we hit this uh, zoom to fit horizontal and zoom to fit vertical, you'll see our new curve here. It's not really a curve, it's a straight line, but that works perfectly well for us. So back in our event graph, what we're going to do is say on update, we are going to get our piece and set relative location, that's the one. And what this is going to do is it's going to set the location of our piece relative to our uh, default scene root. So even if our board is somewhere over here, if we say give it a location of, give it a relative location of 0, 0, 0, it's going to end up at the center of this instead of back at the center of the world. And all we really need to do to make this piece fall is uh, give it a new location. So we're going to right click split this. And for the new location Z, which is our up and down in the uh, world, Z is up and down, we're just going to pass in our height. So what this is going to do is when we tell this timeline to play from start, on update, it's going to go through this curve until it reaches the end. And as it's going through the curve, the update is going to get called, passing in the height to set our relative location of our piece. So it's going to basically fall. We can do the same thing to make the pieces flip over. So if we right click, make a new timeline. I'm going to call this our flip timeline. And inside of here, we're going to add, uh, let's go with two float curves. The first one is going to be our height, because we want it to bounce up and then fall down. 
That way, when it's flipping over, it doesn't flip into the uh, board. And then we want another float curve for our rotation. And we don't need to make another timeline for flipping from black to white or white to black because we can just play it in reverse. Or let's make this length 1 first off. And for our height, we can just right click, add a new point to 0, and the value is going to be 0 because it starts at the bottom. And then at the very end, we're also going to add a time of 1 and a value of 0. And in the center, we're going to do a time of uh, 0 0.5 and a value of, let's go with 100. Let's see what that looks like. It should be fine. And then in our rotation, we're going to add another key to 0. And our value is going to be 0. And then at the very end, we want to add a key at 1. And the value is going to be 180. So it's going to flip 180 degrees, so to the other side. If we go back to our event graph and on update, what we're going to do is get our piece, set relative location on update, split our new location again, passing in our height to the Z. And then we're also going to get our piece and set the rotation. If we go back to the viewport, we can sort of see which uh, rotation we want to deal with. So if we go back to our piece and make it visible temporarily, we can play around with these rotations. So if we do the Y, it should work. So back in our event graph, we're going to split this and in the Y, pass in our rotation. So that actually takes care of our piece animating, so let's actually test this out. If we go to our piece and say, oh, on clicked, we're just going to do play from start, and let's see if this works. We compile, and I dragged a Adelo piece into our game, and if we hit play, we end up with our visual novel. That's because um, by default in our project settings, our default game mode is our VN game mode, so we have to override that in this game or in this level, in our world settings, we can go to game mode override and choose our Azello game mode. Now when we hit play, we don't get our visual novel stuff anymore. So let's hit play, and if we rotate, we can rotate around, but now we can't actually click on our piece because our mouse is gone. So we'll have to make another blueprint class. This is going to be our player controller. This is going to be Azello PC. Sure. And in here, we're going to say show mouse cursor, make that true, and enable click events, otherwise we won't be able to, well, click. So let's compile, save this, go back to our game mode, Azello BP, or sorry, um, Azello GM, and in our player controller class, we're going to choose our Azello PC. Compile, save, play one more time, and we can now see our mouse. So if we click on this, you'll see that it flips around. Great. It's a little slow, and um, it doesn't go as high as I would like, so let's fix that. We'll just go back to our Azello piece in the timeline. Let's just shorten this to be uh, 0.5 seconds. We'll have to move these curves as well, so this is going to be time of 0.25, and this is going to be a time of 0.5. And for the uh, height, I want this to go up to, say, 200. We also have to move this back to a time of 0.5. So let's compile, save, and play again. And if we click on it, it's much faster, and it comes up much higher. Actually, you know what? 100 was fine for our heights. We're going to be looking at it from the top, so it's not going to look too bad, hopefully, when we uh, click on it. Yeah from the top. It looks fine. If you wanted to play it backwards in our event graph, we could just make this uh, reversed from end. So if we compile, save, and play once again, you'll see it now flips from black to white instead of white to black. If we connect this to our piece falling, we can see what that looks like as well. There we go. And it's actually falling rather slow. I should probably make this 0.5 as well. But I do like the height, so this is going to be a value of 0.5 length of 0.5. Always test to make sure stuff works by the way when you're doing stuff because you don't want to do a ton of work and then find out that it doesn't actually uh, well work. So now let's actually spawn our board. We don't want to individually place these on the world one by one. We could if we really wanted to. Uh, we could click on it and then hold on to alt and drag and then we can make a copy that way. Hold on to alt and drag and we can select multiple of these, 1, 2, 3, 4, hold on to Alt and drag, and it makes a copy of all of those. But this isn't very good for 
when we want to actually find our pieces in a grid and stuff like that to know where our piece is and what piece they affect and if you can even place a move there so instead we're just going to get rid of all of these and in our Othello PP I'm just going to make a new function to actually spawn our board so let's get rid of all of these and we're going to make a new function plus on function this is going to be our spawn or let's call it create board and if we click on the colon editor over here and we compile, save, and go back to our level, and we drag a B, uh, Adelo PP in here. In our details, you'll see we now have a button for create board. And whenever we click on this button, this function is going to be called. So when we create a board, we're going to want to know a few things. First off is, um, well, how big is our board? So let's make a new variable. We'll call this board size. We don't need a width and a height, so if we make this public, or uh, instance editable, that's it, and compile, and we look back at our board, you'll see we now have our board size. So back in our Azello PP, what we're going to do is make a 2D for loop and um, we'll basically spawn our tiles based on the index of uh, each of those loops. So let's do for loop and for loop. And then the loop body of this first one is just going to connect into this for loop. And for our first index, it's going to start at 0. And our last index is just going to be our board size minus 1 because this is inclusive. Now, we're going to be doing this a lot in our Othello, um, like a lot, a lot. So to make it so that we don't have to do this every single time, what I'm going to do is first I'm going to plug this into our create board so that we have something going in here. On the loop body, I am going to just do a reroute node. And on the bottom nodes complete, I'm also going to pass this into a reroute node. That way it knows where our inputs and our outputs are that we care about. For the index, I'm just going to do an add. And I'm going to add both of these indexes. We're not actually going to do anything with this. We just want um, our macro to know that we care about our index. So let's uh, select these and right click and choose collapse to macro. And now you see this has collapsed into one convenient uh, little, well, macro. And we can double click this and we can see our original nodes in here. And everything that was connected to something is connected to our output or input. For example, this completed right here wasn't connected to anything, so it's not con um, connected to our output, which is fine because we don't care about it. I do want to reorder this though because it looks kind of weird. In our outputs, I'm going to move our index. Uh, this is called index, regular index. This is going to be our y. Our completed is fine. We'll just move that to the bottom. We can do that by hitting this down arrow twice. And then this index 2 is our x. So let's move this up, move our loop body to the very top, and uh, X is on top of Y. And that looks much cleaner. Oh, we can also rename this macro to something more reasonable. So let's rename this to uh, for each, I don't know, index. Uh, let's go with chord, for each chord. We can now get rid of these over here because we don't care about them. Let's spawn our pieces. So in our loop body, we're going to uh, spawn actor from class. And that class is going to be a little board piece PP. And then we can split this spawn transform to give us our uh, transform location, rotation, and scale. Our rotation and scale are going to be what they are right now. But for our location, we want them to be different based on our X and Y. So let's split this as well. And now we can input our X and Y individually. Our Z is going to be 0. But for our X and our Y, it's going to be our X and our Y times 100. So drag off here, do a times uh, int times float. 100 and pass this into our transform location x same with our y so if we compile save go back to our level and on the um Othello bp we want a board size of eight and then we hit create board you'll see that we now have our board it looks kind of strange though what's going on with that oh it's because i accidentally deleted my uh directional light if we just drag a directional light in here and it looks fine Great, and if we look at the very first piece at the bottom uh, left, you'll see that the location is 0, 0, 0, and the one next to it is 0, 100, 0, and so on. So these are spaced um, perfectly based on the size of our actual board. So uh, you can look at that by just hovering over your mesh for uh, your container, and over there you'll see appro uh, approximate size is 100 by 100 by 8. So if your pieces are bigger or smaller than 100, you can tell what size they are by just hovering over your actual mesh. 
Now let's say you wanted to change the size of your board, which isn't very likely, but let's say you did. And we wanted this to be, let's say, 6. And if we hit Create Board, it'll look like nothing happened. But something actually did happen. You'll notice that we have a lot more pieces over here. Uh, that's because our original pieces did not go away. If we were to click on this and move it away, you'll see that we had a piece underneath it that spawned. If we were to go over here to the edge and move it, you'll see that there was no piece underneath there because it only spawned the 6x6 six six instead of the 8x8, eight eight, which is, you know, what it wanted, but it didn't get rid of the old pieces. So let's take care of that. In our Adelo PP, after we spawn our actor, we want to add it to an array. So let's make a new variable. This is going to be our um, container array. Its type is just going to be a, a Adelo board piece BP object reference, uh, and it's going to be a, well, array. And then we're just going to get our array container and uh, add the piece we spawned to it. So now that we have our container array, what we're going to do before we actually spawn our new pieces is delete all of our old pieces. So we're going to get our container array and do a for each. And inside of this for each loop, we're going to tell our array element to uh, destroy itself. Now when we do this, our container array, its size isn't going to change. So for example, if we had 64 pieces in here, and we told all of them to destroy themselves, this would still be an array containing 64 zings. They would just be nothing. Uh, it would be a container full of null pointers, which is bad. So after we do our for each loop, we're going to tell our container array to empty itself, or clear. And after we clear itself, then we can do our for each loop to spawn our new actors. So let's compile, save, and um, we also need to make sure our container array is instance editable. Otherwise, this a container array won't be affected when we call our create board and add our pieces to it. It's just something about the way Unreal works when you're in editor versus when you're in game. First off, we need to actually destroy all of these pieces because they won't, uh, they're not already inside of our Adelo board's um, container array. You'll see that this array element is zero. So let's destroy all of these. Back in our Adelo PP, we're going to create our board 6x6, six six, and there they are. And if we make this uh, something like 4x4 four four and do a create board, you'll see that it's now 4x4. Four four. If I make this 3x3 three three create board, it is now 3x3. Three three. Now obviously Othello is an 8x8 eight eight board game, so let's just make this 8 and create our board again. And now we have our 8x8. Eight eight. We once again want our pieces to be uh, invisible by default, so let's go back to our viewport, choose our piece, make the piece not visible. Compile, save and now we have a bunch of blank pieces. But we don't just want to start off with an empty board, because in Othello, you start off with black, white, white, black. So to do this, we can go back to our Othello PP, and after we create all of our pieces over here, what we can do is go through our uh, pieces that need to be visible and you know active, and tell it to be visible, and uh, flip to the right side. First, we need a way to actually get our index from our coordinates though. So for example, this would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So at 3, 3, we would want this to be white. And then at 3, 4, we would want it to be black. Uh, we don't want to actually just go through our index and tell it to do it that way because it will be very hard to do that if you only know your index. But by using our coordinates, we can do something like get our board size divided by 2. So uh, 8 would be somewhere over here, and then divided by 2 would bring us to the center. And then we can do our um, center plus one or minus one or whatever to get our actual coordinates for our pieces that need to be black or white. So back in our Zello PP, let's make a new function. We will call this chord to index. And this is going to take in a, it's not going to be two integers. Uh, normally you might want to do that. You might want a int x and an int y, but we already have in Unreal a uh, structure that we can use called int uh, point. And this int point is just an x and a y, but it can't be a negative x or a y in the uh, editor. So that's why we're going to be using it. It's just more convenient to use, especially when we do our uh, min max function. So this parameter is going to be our chord. And then we want an output of just a regular int, which is going to be our index. If we right click this chord and split it, you'll see that we have our chord x and our chord y. And to get our index from our coordinates, it's just going to be our y times our board size plus our x. And this is just the um, inverse of how you get 
your array index based on your x and y. It's just really simple math that you sort of just know once you've done it so many times. So anyways, back in our create board, after we do our for each loop, we want to get our pieces at um, our board size divided by 2 and uh, minus 1 in half the cases. So integer, integer minus integer minus 1 and then we want to get our core 2 index. Uh, let's make this a pure function and we can split this, pass in our x and our y's to get our index of our container array. So get a copy at our index and then off of that we're going to get the piece and set visibility to be true. Now we're going to want four of these so let's copy and paste this one, two, and three and just connect these up. And for our black pieces we actually want to also set the rotation to be 180 so let's get our piece and set um, rotation, relative rotation with a Y of 180. That way the black will be on top instead of the white for those pieces. And for our actual chords, we want our board size divided by 2 for our X. We want the minus 1 for the Y and we want to sort of just plug these into the right spots until they sort of work. Um, you could actually do the math for these and sort of figure out exactly what they should be but I sort of just played around with them until I got it to work. So let's see what this does. If we compile save and play Sorry, don't play. Uh, we hit create board, and we actually got it close to working. Um, our blacks and our whites are in the wrong places, but it was close enough. So we can just I don't know set these to be the uh, other ones. So plug this in here, this one in here, this one in here, and this one in here, uh, and we'll move these to the right locations, of course. Compile, save, and then. We're going to create a board one more time. There it is. And now our pieces are in the uh, right spots. If we want to change our board size to say 10, create a board, they're still in the center and they're still uh, black, white, white, black. If we go to 6, create our board, still in the center, black, white, white, black. So that's great. Uh, you can't do of odd numbers though. If we create a board right now, you'll see that it's not really in the center because you can't really do stuff in the center properly when uh, you have a odd number of stuff. So uh, just stick with even numbers, basically. But you know, we're gonna stick with eight by eight. Now we have to deal with actually playing pieces and stuff like that, and. In order to play a piece, we need to know if we can play a piece there. And in order to know if we can play a piece there, we need to know if it would affect our other pieces. Because if it doesn't actually flip a piece over, it you can't play a piece there. So what we could do is to check if our pieces would flip over, we could go through our container array and look to see the um, well if the piece is visible and what rotation it is to see what piece it is, but that's not really a great idea, especially when we want to do our min-max function because it would be easier to just have a array of um, enums that we could check to see if a piece is there and what side it's on because when we do our min-max function we're gonna have to create um, several versions of the board basically in order for the AI to sort of say alright that's what I'm gonna choose, that's what you're gonna choose, etc. And it's going to have to sort of simulate a ton of versions of the board and it's not a great idea to simulate a ton of actors because we would have to actually create the actors and then uh, look through their information which is not a great idea. So instead what we're going to do is make a, another array of piece um, occupations or whatever you want to call it. So first we need the actual enum so let's go back to our content browser right click go to blueprints and choose enumeration and we're gonna call this um, players now if you don't know an enum is just a number with a word to attach to it so if we make a new enumerator we can make our display name uh, let's go with none for the first one and this none is just a number zero basically and if we make a new one this one is gonna be player one and this player one is just a number one 
and then we want another one for our player 2. So let's save this, go back to our Othello BP, and we're going to make another variable. This is going to be our graph. And instead of being an array of Othello board pieces, it's going to be an array of players. Our enum players. There it is. And we need to make this uh, instance editable as well. And when we create our board, we want to tell our graph to first, well, we want it to first set itself to be none for all of them. And the easier way to do that would just be to uh, empty it. So we're going to clear it, and then we're going to resize it to be our uh, proper size, which would be our board size times itself. Plug board size into both of them, and plug this into our resize. And now when we complete our for each loop, we're going to clear our graph, resize it to be the proper size, and then we're going to set the visibility of our uh, pieces. However, before that, we also want to make sure our graph knows that our black pieces are where the black pieces are and the, black and the white pieces are where the white pieces are. So all we need to do is get the same chord to indexes that we were using for our pieces uh, to set their visibility and rotation. And what we're going to do is just set the array element of our graph at those um, chords to be the right stuff. So drag off our graph and say set array element. And for the item, we want to choose player 1 for our black and uh, player 2 for our white because uh, in Othello, black actually goes first. So that will be player 1. So we want four of these. So let's just copy, paste, paste, paste. So our top two ones are going to go on the bottom two, because that's going to be the white pieces. So this over here goes into here. And then our bottom two are going to go into the top two for our player one. So this one goes up here, and then this one, sorry, drag this over here, this one goes into here. So if we compile, save, and then uh, just remake our board really quick. So create board, and we look at our containers array, you'll see that we have 64, same as our graph. And inside of our graph, we scroll down somewhere into the center, there should be player 2, player 1, player 1, player 2. And these are our white and black pieces. Now that we have our graph, we can check stuff like um, what pieces will be affected when we play a move. So let's add a new function. This function is going to be called get affected pieces. And we're going to need a couple of inputs for this. The first one is going to be our graph. Its type is the player enum array, and the reason we can't just use our graph and assume we're using this graph is because um, of our AI and when we do our min-max function, we want to simulate a bunch of graphs, like I said, and we're going to have to use this uh, get affected pieces on those variations of the graphs. So we can't just assume we're using this graph. Next, we need to know the actual move. So let's add a new input for our move, and this is going to be a single variable and it's going to be an int point. We also need which player played the move, so if it was black or if it's white. So we're just going to call this is player 1. And this is going to be a boolean. We also need to actually return something. We need to return the um, affected pieces. So that is going to be a array of int points, uh, or the chords of the pieces that are affected. So this is going to be a int point array, and we'll call this affected pieces. Now how we're going to find our affected pieces is we're going to look at our move and then go in each direction, up, down, left, right, and in the diagonals, and then keep going until we either reach a empty space, so there's no piece there, or we reach the end of the board, or we reach our own piece. And everything in between there, if we reach our own piece, is going to be added to our affected pieces. So to do this, what we can do is make a array of int points, and that's just going to be our delta. So to actually get our directions, what I would like to do is add a new local variable, um, an array of int points. However, if we were to do this, and we try to do, say, negative 1 in our x, you'll see that it just ends up as 1, because you can't have negatives in the editor when you're doing uh, int points. You can have it as just a thing um, that you make out here, but you can't actually do it as something you do in the editor. So we can't actually do it this way. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to drag off this move and do make array. And then I'm going to add a couple pins in here, and I'm going to split these pins. And off this array, I'm going to do a for each loop. And I'm going to do for our uh, array index 1, it's going to have a positive Sorry, a negative 1. 
in the X, and you'll see that it lets us do the negative one. So if we disc if we break the link to our uh, original move and we split this, we can start filling out our array. So for the first one, it's going to have an X of one and a Y of zero. So that's to our right. Our index one is going to have a negative one X and a Y of zero. So that's going to be our left. And then for our up, we want a Y of one, and then for our down, we want a Y of negative one. Then we need to do our diagonals, so it's going to be x of 1 and y of 1, so that's going to be our uh, top left. Then we need x of 1 and y of negative 1, and that's going to be our bottom left. Add two more pins, and now we need our negative 1 of x and a uh, y of 1, so that's going to be our top left. And then negative x, I mean negative 1 for x, and then negative 1 for y, and that's going to be our bottom left. Now that we have our directions, what we want to do is just keep going in that direction until we, again, either reach an empty space, the edge, or ourself. So in our loop body, we're going to do a for loop with break, because once we hit one of those three um, choices, we're going to want to break out of here. So our first index is going to be 0, and our last index is just going to be our board size, because there's no way we can go past our board size. Sorry, we want the first index to be 1, because if we start with a first index of 0, then we're just going to start with ourself, and we don't want that. So with a first index of 1, what we're going to do is get our array element and multiply it by our index, and that will get us how far away from our um, self in that direction we currently are. So for example, if we are on the first element, we're going to be looking at a delta of 1 and 0 for our right, and then at our second element, we're going to multiply our 1 and our 0 by 2, so it's going to be 2 and 0 to our uh, right. So to save some space, I'm just going to make two new functions, because we also need the add. And this first one is going to be chord times int. And uh, this is a really long word. If we go to our get effective pieces here and right click and say chord times int, you'll see that this takes up a lot of space. So what I'm going to do is go to our compact node title over here, and I'm just going to type in x and you'll see that it's now just a giant X instead of um, that big long name. We also want this to be pure, so now it doesn't take in the execution pins, and then back in our chord times int, we want an input of our chord, so our int point is just going to be a single variable. This is going to be chord, and we want the int that we're multiplying by, so integer int. And our output is going to be a int point, and we'll just call this output. Let's split these, and all we're going to do is multiply these by the int, like that. So now when we go back to our get affected pieces, you'll see we have our chord, and we have our int, and outputs an int. So let's plug in our array element. I'm just going to do some reroute notes to make this a little cleaner. And uh, plug in the index to the int over here. And now what we need to do is add this output to our move. So that's what this uh, new function is going to be for, plus function. This is just going to be chord plus chord. And again, we're going to output a chord, and we're going to take in two chords. Like that. So all we did was add our x to our x, and our y to our y, and then output that. To be honest, we don't really need to do it like this. We could just do it in our actual uh, thing over here. But it would take up more space, and it would look a lot messier, so I choose to do it like this. Plus, we're going to need to reuse at least our uh, chord plus chord, I think. So if we drag off here and just do chord plus chord, we're going to add these two chords together. And now we need to check to see if this chord that we get at the very end of this is actually in range or not. Because if it's outside of the board, then we need to break. So we're going to make another function. This is going to be uh, is chord in range. And it's just going to return a boolean called is in range and we need to take in a chord so type is int point and we'll just call it chord and to check to see if it's in range all we're going to do is split this chord and we're going to check to see if the x is uh, greater or equal to zero and if the y is greater or equal to zero and if the x is less than our um, board size and if our y is less than our board size because if any of these are false that means we are out of range so if they are all true, that means we are in range. So we can just return this boolean with our um, and, like that. We also want to make sure this is pure to just, you know, not have another execution pin. And back in our get affected pieces, we're going to ask if this 
is in range. And then we're going to branch off that. Now if this is false, what we're going to do is connect this to our break. But we actually need to do something in between there, which we can't do just yet because we don't have the right variable. So I'm just going to move on to say if it's true. So if it is true, what we're going to do is check our graph at the index of this chord. So we're going to get this chord uh, to index. And we're going to get the graph, uh, get a reference at this index. And now we need to switch off what we get. So if it is none, we are also going to break. And again, we can't break just yet because we don't have the right variable. And if it is player one, we need to do something. And if it's player two, we need to do something depending on if we are player one or not. So what I'm going to do is get our is player one. I'm going to add some more reroute nodes. And I'm going to do two branches off of here. Now, if we are player one and the piece we found is player one, then we're going to have to break. And again, we can't break just yet. But if it is false, so if we are player two and the piece we found is player one, then what we need to do is add it to an array of potential pieces. So let's add a new local variable. This is going to be an array of int points, and we'll just call this potential pieces. And we're going to get our potential pieces and add the chord that we found. So that would be this over here. So in the false for our uh, player one branch, it's going to connect to this. And if we are player one and we found a player two, then the same thing applies. We need to add to our potential pieces the chord that we found. Otherwise, we're going to break. Now, when we break, we want to actually clear out our potential pieces. Otherwise, when we go to the next loop, our potential pieces is still going to contain all the pieces that we found in the last loop. So when we break, we have to tell our potential pieces to clear itself. Now I'm going to do that back over here just uh, because it's going to look confusing if we do it over here. So I'm going to get our potential pieces and say clear. And every time we break um, over here, 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 and here, it's going to connect to this clear. And this clear is going to connect to our break in our for each loop with break. So let's add just a ton of reroute nodes. There we go. So now we have our, if our chord is in range, if it's false, it connects to our clear. If we get a none, then it connects to our clear. And before we actually connect our true and our false in our player one and player two, we need to add all of our potential pieces into a array of, well, actual affected pieces. So that, um, well, before we clear, they're actually added. So let's create another local variable. Again, it's going to be an endpoint point array. And we'll just call this pieces. Sure because affected pieces is taken up by our return node. So let's get our pieces and just add or append. And we're going to append our potential pieces. So this true and this false are just going to connect to this append. And this append is just going to connect to our clear potential pieces, which connects to our break in our for uh, loop with break. And we should end up something like this. At the very end, of course, once you've gone through every single direction, so at the end of this uh, for each loop, we want to connect our completed to our return node and our affected pieces is our pieces array. And if I did everything right, then this function should return all the pieces that would be affected when you place a move as this player into this uh, graph. Oh, my bad. Uh, we don't want to get from our graph over here in our uh, core to index. We want to get our graph that we passed in over here. Make sure you do that and not choose your actual graph that we have as a variable over here. Otherwise, things will get very messed up in the future. So now that we have our affected pieces, we can make another function and we'll call this get available moves. And this get available moves, we need our um, same inputs really as our get affected pieces because our min max function is going to need to get our available moves for its simulated um, graphs. So add a new parameter. This is going to be our players. Um, array and we just call this graph and then we need another parameter this is going to be a boolean for which player you are so uh, is player one and this is not going to be an array it's going to be a single variable and we're going to return a array of uh, chords so int point array and we'll call this available moves. And this is going to sound somewhat silly, but there's really no other way to do this. 
we're just going to go through every single chord so we can get this macro that we made earlier when we did our uh, create board over here this macro and we're going to go through each chord and check to see if it uh, has affected chords so we're going to get the affected pieces and let's see when we get our available moves we're going to go through each of our chords and in the loop body of going through our chords we are going to pass in our graph and if we are player one and for the move it's just going to be we're going to split this we're going to choose x and y and if the affected piece's length is greater than zero so if we actually affect something which we have to in Othello then we are going to add that to an array of available moves so let's create a new local variable this is going to be an in point array we'll just call this moves and in the move we're going to get the moves and add the uh, well chord that we're at so let's split this and just add our x and our y before we do that though we actually have to check to see if our graph at this x and y doesn't have a piece it has to be an empty piece in order for us to actually play a move there so we're going to get this graph get a reference at our x and y uh, two chords so let's make int point passing in our x and our y passing this in point to uh, get or sorry to index and we're going to ask if this get is equal to a enum we're going to make a uh, literal enum players and we want the enum type to be none so if we branch off this and if it is true then we're going to get our affected pieces anyways once we've gone through every single chord so on the complete we're just going to return our moves so let's compile, save, and uh, that should take care of our get available moves. So let's actually test this. Let's go back to our event graph and let's say, oh, on begin play, we're just going to get our available moves, passing in our own graph right now that we currently have, and we are player one. And we're just going to go through each of these and we're going to print out the um, X and the Y to see what chords we get for our available moves. So if we go back to our level and hit play, we should see four things pop up. Hit play, and there are four things right there. Let's actually make sure they're correct. If we go to our output log, we see three two, so it's zero, one, two, three, one, two, which is a place black can play. We have two three, zero, one, two, one, two, three. Again, it's place black and play. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. And then this should be four, five right here. So that's great it is giving us all the uh, places we can actually play. So this get available moves is working with this graph at least. If we switch this to be not player one, compile and play, we should get the opposite moves. So four, two is uh, one, two, three, four, two is over here. White can play here. Same with five, three, uh, two, four is here. And three, five is up here. So that's working fine. Now you might be wondering why we're not making our get available moves pure. Uh, same with our get affected pieces. If you think about it, these really could be pure. We don't really need an ex execution pin. All we want to get is our um, array and then go through each of them to do stuff. The problem is that, is that when you get a variable from a pure function, it actually calls the function again. So for example, if we were to make this pure, so there's no execution pin, and then we go through each of these and inside our get available moves, what I'm going to do is do a print first and we compile and if we hit play you'll see that we get a bunch of hellos in here there's one two three four five six seven eight nine hellos so what's happening is our get available moves is getting called nine times which is not great for performance if we were to make this not pure go back and uh, plug in our get available moves and then we hit, we hit play you'll see we only get one hello that's why we're not making this a uh, pure function. Same with our um, get affected pieces because we don't want these getting called for every single time. We want to do something inside of this array. Alternatively, what we could do is make this pure again. And then back in our event graph, we could save this to a variable. So let's promote this to a variable. It doesn't matter what we call it. And then instead of getting our array from this pure function, we get it from the variable we set. And if we compile and play now, it didn't actually print. My bad, I forgot I deleted the uh, hello. So let's hit play again. And you'll see we only got one hello this time, even though this is a pure function because 
we are only getting we're only getting this um, array once when we set our new variable here and then after that we get our new variable instead of getting it from this array so that's another possibility but I'd rather not promote stuff to variables a lot of time I don't like having a lot of variables um, so I'm gonna make this not here and we're just gonna connect the uh, execution pins instead it's not that big of a deal anyways now that we have our get available moves we can actually start playing moves on our um, boards, what is it called, a double board piece, we can go to our event graph and instead of doing on clicked piece, uh, let's get rid of this, we're going to do on clicked on our board. Because our piece should not be visible when we actually want to play a piece, because obviously we can't play a piece if there's already a piece there. So when we do our on clicked board, we are going to first check to see if our piece is visible, because if it is, then we can't play the piece obviously. So get visibility, get is visible, uh, branch. And off of this branch is false, we are going to play the timeline for um, making the piece fall. So play from start over here. And then we also have to tell the board that we are playing this piece. And we need to actually set our piece to be visible. So let's get our piece and set visibility to be true. And now we need to tell the board that we're actually playing a piece. And we also need to tell the board which piece is being played. So let's add some new variables for this. First off is going to be our board. We'll just call this our Othello board. And its type is just going to be the Othello PP. We will make this public and exposed to spawn, or instance editable and exposed to spawn. And we also want another variable for our chord. So this is going to be a vector point, or sorry, int point. And once again, we'll make this public and uh, exposed to spawn. So back in our Othello PP, when we spawn our pieces in our create board, we want to refresh this. And for the Othello board, we're just going to pass on our self. So get reference to self right there. And for our chord, we can just split this and pass in our X and our Y. Now that that's done, we can go back to our event graph and let's make another uh, custom event. And we'll call it play move. And what we need to do know when we play a move is, um, well, what where we're playing it. So disk is going to take in an int point, and it's going to be our move. When we play the move, we need to affect the data in our graph. So let's make another function. Actually, we'll call this um, simulate move, and this is going to take in once again a graph or um, player enum uh, array, and this is going to be the graph. We need the actual move, so it's going to be int point, single variable, and it's going to be called move. And then we also need which player it is. So we need a boolean for um, is player one. And then our output is going to be a, another graph. It's going to be our out graph, or let's call it simulated graph. And its type is going to be another array of player enums. Now when we play this move, all we're going to do is get the affected uh, tiles and we need to pass in the graph, the move, and if it's player 1 and then we're going to go through each of these chords and tell them to flip over basically. So in our graph, what we're going to do is uh, set the array element. The index is going to be our affected pieces. Uh, let's do for each. It's going to be our array element to index. And what we're actually setting it to is going to be uh, depending on if we're player 1 or not. So off the item, we're going to drag off and do a select. And our wildcard is going to be if we're player 1. And if it's true, we can drag off here, do a uh, make er, literal enum players. True for player 1 means that it is going to be player 1. And false for player 1 is going to be uh, player 2. So we're probably going to actually have to do this uh, more than once, where we have to do a select based on if it's player 1 or not, so you get the enum. So I'm going to make another function. This is going to be our player to enum. And this is going to take in a boolean, that's a single variable, and it's going to be is player 1. And the output is just going to be a uh, player enum. I'm going to make this a peer function to get rid of the execution pin, and then off of here we can do our select, passing in our is player 1, and our options are going to be uh, player 1 for true and false is going to be player 2. So back in our simulate move we can get rid of this and uh, we're going to do our player 2 enum instead. So get our player 2 enum, drag our player 1 in here and drag our enum into here. So that takes care of actually flipping the pieces, well at least on the data side we still need to tell the pieces to actually flip. 
but then after we set our array elements, it's not actually going to uh, place the piece of our actual move over here. So once we've completed our for each loop, we also need to get our move to index and set our graphs of array element at that index to be this over here. Now at this point we would return our graph uh, after we set our array element for our actual move that we played. However there is one problem and that is when you affect your graph, when you set your array element of a array, it actually modifies the um, array that you passed in. So if our AI calls this simulate move, which it will, it's going to affect our actual graph and the data is going to be all wrong. It's not going to be representative of what our actual board is right now because it's going to be going through several iterations where it has to do this. So instead we are going to have to promote this graph to a local variable and we'll just call this local graph. And anywhere we would pass our graph into, we're going to pass in our local graph instead. So our target element, our target array, and our target array over here is going to be off the local graph instead. So now at this point, we can return not our graph, but our uh, si local graph right here as our simulated graph. So let's compile and save this. And then back in our event graph, when we play move, we are going to simulate move. That graph is going to be our uh, current graph. Our pl is player one is uh, we don't have that yet. So let's make a new variable. This is going to be player one's turn question mark. Uh, we don't need to make this public. And we plug our play move into simulate move. Our move is going to be the move we passed in, and our is player one is if it's player one's turn because obviously we won't be able to uh, call this function if it's not our turn. And then we're going to get our simulated graph and set our current graph to be that, because that's going to be what our graph looks like now. Now before we actually modify the data about our graph, we have to tell all the uh, pieces in the actual game right here to flip over. Um, so to do this, we can just get our current graph and get the affected pieces of this move, and if it's player's one's turn, and then for each of these, we are going to get the array element uh, to index and then get our container array and get uh, a copy at that index and then tell it to flip over. We're going to need another function in our actual board piece where we tell it to flip over. So let's make a new custom event. We'll call this flip piece. And this is going to take in a boolean to know which side we're going to. So is player one question mark. And then we're going to branch off this. If it is player 1, then we need to reverse from end, I believe. And if it's false, we need to play from start. Or it's the other way around. Let's uh, just test to see which one it is. So back in our Zello PP, after we've gone through our loop body and told our container array to flip piece, passing in if it's player 1's turn on the completed, then we can do our simulate move and set our graph to be what the new graph is. Let's test to see if this works. We'll go back to our board piece and on click board. Before we set our visibility and stuff like that, we need to tell our board that we've uh, played the piece. So let's go get our Adelo board and play move. And the move is going to be our current chord. Ah, our Adelo board is not equal to anything right now. And neither is our chord because we made that exposed to spawn after we actually created these. So when they were created in our create board, these um, the Zello board and the cord weren't being set. So we need to just create our board one more time. Wait, first we need to go to our Zello BP and players one turn is true. It should start off with player one's turn. And we click on here, nothing happens. Um, I think that's because we're clicking on our piece instead of our board. But if we click on a corner here where our piece is not at, you'll see our piece falls and this flips, but it is completely wrong. So in our uh, board, piece, our true is our play from start, and our false is our uh, reverse from end. And then we also have to, when we play our piece, we have to tell the um, piece to rotate to be the appropriate rotation. So when we play our move, um, when we set the visibility of our piece, we're also going to have to set the rotation based on if we are, if it's currently black or white's turn. We can get our little board, get player one's turn, and then off this new rotation, let's just split this, and then on the Y, we'll do a select 
based on the boolean and if it is true then this should be 180. So let's get our piece and say on clicked and this is also going to plug into our branch right here and hopefully that takes care of the uh, piece getting clicked on. So if we hit play, click right here, great. Our piece falls down and then those get flipped over. Uh, if we click here because it's still player one's turn because we never actually deal with that so let's go to our little ward and after we play our move we're going to check to see if this graph has any available moves for the opposite player. So to get our opposite player all we're going to do is get our player one's turn or and then say not. And the reason we're doing this is because we have to check to see if it actually goes to the next player's turn or not. Because in Othello you can actually not have a move available after your opponent moves and then it's still your opponent's turn. So if the moves available the uh, length is uh, greater than zero then we are going to set our uh, player's one's turn to be well whatever it, it currently isn't right now. Otherwise what we're going to do is just leave it as our player one's turn. So if this is true then we're going to set player one's turn to be this not and if this is false then it's still going to be player's one's turn but then we have to check to see if player one can actually move because if they can't then that means the game is over. So let's get our player one's turn and then uh, also get our available moves and then we have to check to see if this length is also uh, greater than zero. Actually you know what let's check to see if this length is equal to zero because uh, we're not going to have anything off the true if it is uh, greater than zero so if this is equal to zero then what we're going to do is just say that the game ended because neither player has any moves available left. So off the true for now we're just going to print and um, say game over. And we could display the score, uh, that's pretty easy to get. So if we just make a new function, we'll call this our, let's say, get players pieces count. And this is gonna return two integers. The first one is gonna be our player one count and the second one is gonna be our player two count. All this is gonna do is take in a graph. So new input, uh, players enum array and we'll just call this graph. We're just going to go through each of these for each. If the piece at that uh, location is player 1 then we just add 1 to player 1 and if it's player 2 then we're just going to add 1 to player 2. So we need two local variables uh, to store those. So on the local variables we'll add two new integers. Uh, they're just going to be called player 1 and player 2. And in the loop body we're going to get the array element and switch on it. If it is player 1 we do our player 1 and uh, we can actually do a plus plus and that gets us our increment int which all this does is it gets the um, value you passed in it adds one to it and then it sets the value of whatever you passed in to be uh, whatever it is plus one so now we don't have to do something like player one plus one and then set player one to be equal to this this just takes a little bit of space so we are going to do the same thing for our player two so get player two and plus plus. And then when we complete all we're going to return is our uh, player 1 and our player 2 to our player 1 and player 2 count obviously. So if we compile, save this, and then back in our event graph when it is game over we are going to get our player pieces count sending in our graph and well print it out. So instead of using a print string here I'm going to do a print text and off this text I'm going to do a format text and this format text is going to be uh, game over uh, shift enter to add a new line and then we can do player one score with a colon and then uh, curly brackets with a let's just go x shift enter again for player two score colon with a y and in the x and y we'll just pass in the uh, player one and player two count Okay, so apparently I was wrong in our Othello board piece, when we do our set relative rotation, uh, false is 180 and true is 0. In our play move, let's get our available moves with our uh, graph, and it's player 1 is going to be, well, if it's player 1's turn. And then, before we actually do any of this stuff, we need to check to see if our um, array we get out of here contains the move. And if it does, then we can do this stuff. Oh yes, and um, even though we're checking to see if we have available moves and that would, you know, call this stuff, when we actually click on our piece, it's not checking that. It's just saying if our piece is visible, then we're assuming 
that we can set the visibility and stuff like that. Instead of checking our available moves here when we play our move, because that can be quite cumbersome if you want to just you know click around randomly and um, not actually be able to play a move there, uh, what we're going to do is after every move we're going to save our available moves. So let's just get our available moves and uh, save this. So let's promote this to a variable. We'll call this available moves. And instead of checking to see if this um, available moves from our function contains our move, we are going to check to see if the available moves that we saved contains it. And let's see. Where we're actually going to set our available moves is going to be after we successfully play a move. So over here-ish, on this branch, when we try to see if we're uh, switching player's turn or not, if we do successfully switch the player's turn, then we're going to update our available moves. And we can just pass in our uh, player 1's turn over there, we don't need this. And we also have to do the same thing if we fail this branch over here. So if our length is equal to 0, if that's false, so the game is still going, uh, we need to update over here as well our available moves, sending in our is player 1. Now back in our Zelda board piece, this branch is also going to check to see if our Adelo board dot get available moves contains our chord. So we need to do an and. Now we need to actually make this uh, piece visible, make it not. Otherwise it's going to say our piece is visible, therefore we um, can play a move, which is obviously not right, so we need to put a not here. And instead of connecting our false to our play move, we're going to connect our true. So that should fix any issues with playing in places that we can't actually play in. So if we hit play one more time, and just try to click around, uh, nothing happens. If we try to click somewhere where we can actually play, nothing happens. Because our Adelo never actually knows its available moves at the very beginning of the game. So in begin play, let's not use this stuff and instead set our available moves to be um, our available moves. And our player 1 is going to be true at the very start of the game, so we can just put a checkbox right there for true. One more time, click over here and we can play here. And white can play here and black cannot play any of these places, so it obviously won't play. If we click here though, black can't play here. So that's working fine. Now I'm just gonna speed through a game so we can look at our output log to see what happens when we reach the end of a game. And there's only one move left, we click here and now it says game over because it knows that there are no more moves and player 1 score is 28 and player 2 score is 36 so player 2 won in this instance. Now, when we actually play a move, you'll see that the piece falls and the piece flips over at the same time, which I personally do not like. So let's fix that. I believe we can fix this pretty easily actually by just making our Zelda board play the move on our piece falling timeline finished instead of doing it before here. So let's just cut this. This uh, branch now plugs into our set visibility instead and our Zelda board needs to be plugged into our is player one's turn. but. After that, it should work, I think. If we compile, save, and play, and we click, our piece falls, and then our pieces flip over. So that's weird. Um, earlier, it wanted our false to be 180 and our true to be 0 for it to work, but now it's working properly for some reason. Um, I'm not sure why it wasn't working properly earlier, but now, with the correct values, our black falling is, well, black, and our white falling is, well, white. So right now, we can't really easily demonstrate this because it wouldn't really work. Well, actually it would work, but I'm not good enough at Adelo to manipulate the board so I can get a scenario where it would work, but um, we're not checking to see if a piece is falling or flipping right now. So if we were to play a move and we were fast enough to click in a spot where we could have played a move last time, but we can't at the moment, the moves would actually try to play at the same time, which is not great. I can't actually show that right now because what's happening is our board piece is checking to see if our cord contains or if our uh, adult board contains the available moves and this is not updated until we actually do our play move which is called after the piece is done falling so when we actually play a move it doesn't immediately change our available moves so it's going to be really hard for me to actually uh, show a scene where our piece is falling and we can actually play a move while the piece is falling. So we also need to go back to our Zello BP and make two new booleans and these are going to be if a piece is falling or um, 
is flipping. Actually, we only really need one. Uh, let's just call this piece is animating. And in our Azello board piece, we need to add another pin to this end, and we need to check to see if the board uh, has a piece that is animating. If the piece is not animating, then we can play a move. So we need a knot to plug into this end. Now when we play a piece, we're going to set our Adzello board uh, pieces animating to be true. And then on our uh, piece finished falling, we do our play move, and when the move does the play move, it's going to tell all of our pieces to flip. And once all the pieces are done flipping, then our piece is animating is going to be false. So we are going to need a new integer. This is going to be our falling pieces count. And in our uh, loop body, before we do all this stuff over here, we know that playing a move will flip a piece over. So we're going to set our piece count falling to be zero because it's zero at the moment. And for each of the affected pieces, we are going to increment our falling piece count. So we can just say plus plus. And now we need another custom event to tell our pieces that they have finished falling. So let's just right click custom event. We'll call this a uh, piece finished falling. And when a piece finished falling, all we're going to do is get our pieces count and say minus minus. And if it is equal to zero after that, so equal to zero. That means all of our pieces have finished falling and if they have we can just set our uh, pieces animating to be false. Sorry, why did I name these falling? I meant uh, flipping. So piece finish flipping and instead of uh, falling pieces count it should be flipping pieces count. Anyways, back in our Adzello board piece BP on our flip timeline on finished we're just gonna get our Adzello board and tell it a piece finish falling. So piece finish flipping, not falling, flipping. And um, that should take care of any problems where the player can play uh, multiple moves at the same time. Uh, actually, it shouldn't really be too much of an actual problem because there's going to be an AI, obviously. So the player can't play for the AI, but we'll check to see if this stuff is true anyways. Uh, just in case the player is playing against himself for whatever reason. So if we hit play, stuff should still work. Click here, it falls, and then we can still uh, play. And we can still only play while a uh, piece is not falling. Anyway, speaking of AI, uh, we'll probably just leave that for another video because this is already getting to be really, really long. So hopefully I will see you then. The AI, by the way, just in case you didn't watch the uh, other videos, it's not going to be like Unreal's Blueprints uh, AI where you make your uh, behavior trees and Blackboard and stuff like that. We're It's just going to be a recursive algorithm called the min-max function. Um, look it up if you don't feel like waiting. But yeah, this, that should do it for this video.